All right, guys. Preach the word, bro. Uh, well, turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy. Second right. Timothy. Let's go, bro. We're going to do a little study in 2 Timothy tonight. I forgot the stand. I have the wood part, but I don't have the stand part. So we're kind of going a little old school here. <laughs> this is how it used to be. So when we were in the, in the building over there, this is kind of cool like to think about uh, how much we've grown and, and these kind of things. Like that room over there wouldn't even house us on Sundays anymore. Oh. It'd be just right for the amount of people that we have here today. Uh, but it wouldn't. And so we had this, the, I had to preach on this, uh, this round, this high top what they call it, you know, it was about this high, which is fine, uh, but I, I like to move around a little bit more and, and stuff like that, but that room got so hot. It got, I mean, this was for me, you know, me, like some of y'all, this is normal for you, right? It was just hot. And, uh, but uh, um, when we first got here, we didn't have a podium. I preached on this for a long time, uh, just like this, and uh, I didn't like it. I didn't like it at all, but, uh, but this is fine, amen? You get, you, as long as the word is preached, right? All right, so 2 Timothy chapter 1, we're going to dive into the relationship between uh, Paul and Timothy to some degree today, and the title of our lesson today is, What Kind of Men God Makes? What Kind of Men God Makes? And the relationship between Paul and Timothy was that of a father and a son. You know, one of the books that I read a long time ago was by a guy named John Eldridge. He wrote this book called Wild at Heart. Some of you might be familiar with that content. But uh, he had a newer book that came out called Fathered by God. It was actually a reprint of an older book. And I've been rereading that over the past few weeks and just getting a lot out of it. Uh, there is nothing, and those of us that have had good fathers will agree with this. Those of us that had bad fathers will agree with this. Those of us that have had no fathers will agree with this on some level. Is that there is nothing, nothing more harden, hardening to a young man's heart than a lack of a father. Because masculinity is bestowed. It is not earned it is not given, it is bestowed. Yeah. Huh. You have to learn it. And you cannot learn masculinity, you cannot learn how to be a man from a woman. Yeah. This is the biggest problem in our society today. Many of us grew up with single moms, and single moms are awesome. My wife and I have a special heart, a special place in our heart for single mothers. We have a special place in our heart for the sons and daughters of single mothers. But the reality is, is that God did not design men to grow up in single family homes. And so the problem of our society today is you've got so many men that are gravitating towards whatever masculinity is in their particular culture. Maybe, maybe it's money. Maybe it's the the you know the hip hop scene maybe it's whatever it is whatever masculine culture is in your particular area of the city your particular area of the state or the country you gravitate towards that yeah and that becomes your standard of masculinity wow. now today which is kind of cool about what's going on today with the internet and social media and stuff and all these influences is that you can actually be influenced by people outside of your culture. That's true, bro. Now that can actually be good or it can actually just ingrain you deeper and deeper and deeper into the culture that you already have. As disciples of Christ, as Christians, we only have one place to go for us to receive our masculine culture. And sadly, growing up for me, it was not the church. It was not even my father. I love my father. I spent a couple weeks with him uh, just a, a little bit ago. I love him to death. And he taught me many, many good things. 
but he did not know how to be a man of God. Therefore, he could not teach me how to be a man of God. We're trying to change that here in Fresno with this group right here. Because prayerfully, guys like Mike and I, the older guys in the group, can model godly masculinity, can model being godly men, and therefore pass that down onto the younger men. And then you, being younger men, can pass that on down to even younger men and those around you. Yeah. So we create a culture of godly men here in Fresno. Come on. Come on, and that's my job. Come on. My job is not to preach on Sunday. My job is not to study the Bible with people. No, my job is to raise my son and raise my spiritual sons to be men of God. If that happens... People will become disciples, no problem. We'll be able to preach lessons on Sundays, no problem. People will study the Bible. People will come out of the woodwork because they're going to go, what is so different about Isaiah? You became a disciple? You got bath? You're going to church now? What is going on with you? Because you're way different now. Gustavo going through all this stuff in his life and handling it like a champ? Man, any other man would be like weak sauce crying in the corner or running away and he's not he's facing it like a man like a man of god but here's the problem just like disciples need to be made men need to be made and god is trying to do that but oftentimes what you and i do is we resist that second timothy chapter one verse one says paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Some crazy things happen in this particular passage. So we read in chapter 2 or chapter 1, verse 3, it says, I thank God, whom I serve as my ancestors did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. What's the first thing that this father in the faith to this young man did? He prayed for him daily. Not just daily, night and day. He longed to see him. If you look in verse 4, recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. And he had fond memories of him. Verse 5, I am reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you. See, what's crazy about Timothy is Timothy was raised by a single mom. Wow. Now, he did have a father. His father was Greek. It does mention it as a footnote in the scriptures, but the, the dad was not the spiritual man in this dude's life. His grandma was and his mom was. And in fact, if I look through my history, that's the only reason why I'm here right now. My grandma Edna and my mother. My grandma prayed over and over. She'd make these tapes. Some of y'all don't even know what I'm talking about. She'd make these tapes and we'd listen to them uh, and she'd sing songs. She'd read Bible verses. She'd pray. She would tell stories. She would read stories because uh, I grew up in kind of a chaotic household that had a lot of noise at night, uh, a lot of banging around and a lot of screaming and yelling. And so it would be a way for us to drown out, my brother and I in our room, the noise in our house. And at the end of every one of them, she always prayed. She did not pray this for my brother. She prayed this for me, Eric. She did not pray this for my brother. She prayed this for me, that I would be a preacher. Wow. Now, 40 years later, (laughs) I'm a preacher, right? So I can relate with this. But as any father would his son, Paul sought to encourage Timothy to be a man, to make good use of the blessings and the opportunities that were given to him. Look here in verse 6. For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. To become the kind of man that God intended him to be, he needed to use his gift. He needed to use his gifts. He needed to use what God had given him to do something with it. Yeah. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. 
For the Spirit of God, for the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. What does God intend for a man to be? What kind of man is God making? What kind of God, man is God willing to create for those who submit to his workmanship? God is wanting to make something out of you. Yeah. To make someone out of you. Come on. But you have to be willing to submit to his workmanship. We're going to look at 2 Timothy 1.7 as our core text. And we're going to dive in from there because this is the kind of man that God makes. Mm. God makes us what? He does not make us timid. Mm. So that means he makes us the opposite of timid. God, does, God gives us a spirit of power, a spirit of love, and self-discipline. And so that's what we're going to get into today. Again, the title of our lesson tonight, What Kind of Men God Makes. Come on, bro. First of all, God makes fearless men. God makes fearless men. But here's the problem. Men of God do not always start out fearless. They do not always start out bold. Peter displayed cowardice on several occasions. Let's take a look at a couple of these. Go to Matthew chapter 14. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Matthew chapter 14. We're going to do a lot of flipping today, guys. Come on, bro. Or scrolling, depending on how you look at it, sure. <laughs> Matthew 14, verse 30. But when he saw the wind, this is... You guys remember the story. Jesus is walking on water. Peter realizes it's Jesus. And he says, hey, if it's really you, call me out onto the waves and I'll come to you. He says, well, come on, let's go. So he hops out of the boat, starts walking. But look what happens. But when he saw the winds, he was afraid and began to sink. Cried out, Lord, save me. Wow. Pulling him by the hand. What did Jesus say? You have, why, why do you doubt? Why you doubt? Matthew 26, verse 69, says, Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard. We're again familiar with this story. Yeah. And a servant girl came to him. You were also with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway, where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to cow down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken before the rooster crows. You will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Mm. Impetuous Peter. Put your foot in your mouth, Peter. The guy that should have had the guts, should have had what it took to stand up to these Romans. I mean, he had a lot in the garden when he cut off somebody's ear. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But here he is, cowering out. Mm -hmm. Paul even had the same situation. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2, write that down. It says, I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling when he first encountered the Corinthian church. Yet, men of... Yet, the, 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 <laughs> yet, even though men of God start out lacking boldness, God develops boldness in them. Go to the book of Acts. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Go to the book of Acts. Starting in Acts chapter 4. Let's go. Something happened to the apostles that even though all of them ran away from trouble, ran away from Jesus, de deserted him, left him alone, that they, something happened to them. God changed them somehow. Acts chapter 4, verse 13. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Something had shifted. 
in Peter. Something had shifted in John. That now, the religious community, they weren't running away from little girls, little servant girls in the courtyard, but they were standing up to the religious elite of their time. Paul later confessed in in the face of his trial. Acts chapter 20, verse 24. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. And later in chapter 21, 13, he says, Then Paul answered, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. What does it take for a man to be willing to die for their cause. That's boldness. That's boldness. To be willing to die. You know, oftentimes we study the Bible with people and we talk about the cost of following Jesus. And we're familiar with this passage, right? We go to Luke 9 and we talk about denying yourself and taking me across daily. And typically what happens in that passage is we go, what does it mean to take up your cross? So, well, to die to yourself every day. Yeah, there, there are tons of times we got to die. to. Okay, that's not me that's alive right now. It's Jesus that's alive through me. I got to kill myself today. Not kill myself physically. You guys get what I'm saying. Every day, there's a part of me that has to die so that Christ can live in me. So that I do the right thing, not the wrong thing. Well, then we skip on over to the cost, the heading of the cost of following Jesus, Luke 14, and it says, and anyone who does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. And most of the time we just double down on the fact that, oh, well, because carry the cross means deny yourself and die to yourself every day in Luke 9, it must mean the same thing in Luke 14. No, it does not. When can you only take up your cross once it's when you die on it every single apostle except for the apostle john died a martyr's death gruesome severe peter the only one to have been married not only did it affect him but it affected his wife as well who was also crucified and Peter goes, if, G- if my Lord got crucified and my wife got crucified, I'm not going to get crucified. I'm going to get crucified upside down. Wow. What boldness. Wow. To go from being a fraidy cat, <laughs> to being freaked out and scared, to dying for your faith. Yeah. Come on. Why would our brothers and sisters in the second and third world, Muslim countries and Hindu countries, be the only ones that have to die for their faith? Just because we're Americans doesn't mean the words of the Bible mean something different for us as it does for them. Now, be grateful that you're not being called to die, but many of us have a hard time living for Jesus, much less dying. Come on, bro. Preach that. You look at today's Christian society, I don't see very many Christians. Yeah. You guys have heard me yell this statistic from the pulpit I don't know how many times. <laughs> 85% of Americans claim to be Christian. You turn on the news, does that look like 85% of Americans are Christian? No, not at all. Especially now with crazy flags waving in the air, people don't understand what gender they are, bucking reality, right? Two plus two could equal five, it doesn't equal four anymore, and if you say that it equals four, because that's somehow like absolute truth, you believe in absolute truth and you're now a racist. And yet, how many men, how many men your age are just accepting of it? Are just accepting of it? Because here's the reality, guys. It's, 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 not, it's, it's, the, it's not the 20-somethings that are, are the rallying cry for this. It's guys like me. It's late 30s to 40s that are going, this is nuts, this is wacky, this is ridiculous, this should not be. But so many young people are just swallowing it. 
Hook, line, and sinker. God calls us as men to be better. God calls us as men to stand up against the culture and go, no, that is wrong. Consequences, who cares? I would rather, there's an old country song that you got to stand for something or you'll fall for everything. We've got to stand up for something. And as disciples of Jesus, who, who, who else is going to stand for the truth? Yeah. Who else is going to stand up for logic and reason than disciples of Jesus? Come on, bro. Come on. Men like Paul came with meekness and weakness and insecurity, and yet they are known to put their lives on the line. Men like Peter, right? Why is the Bible so real? Because it's relatable to us. You look at any other spiritual it deifies the writer. It deifies the prophet. The Bible actually gives us the real deal of who these guys were. Yeah. Why? Because if, it can be cha- if their hearts can be changed, our hearts can be Come changed. On, That's right. Yeah, be fired up about it. Come on. So how does God make fearless men? How do people go from this transition? Well, Matthew chapter 8, verse 26. Fear is indicative of little faith. Wow. If you have fear, you not have faith. The opposite of faith is not no faith. Every one of us has faith. Fear is faith. You're just fearing the negative instead of having faith in the positive. Right? Have you ever heard the acronym for fear? False evidence appearing real? You still have to have faith. Matthew chapter 8, verse 26, he replied, You have little faith. Why? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. Do you think that put faith into the guys? Absolutely. Here is Peter. Lord, save me. (laughs) Jesus is like, fine. And then he, he, he goes, guys, you're freaking out. Stop it. Look at what God can do. Be still. Calm. First, teen, love casts out fear. It says there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. If we have fear in our life, it's because we're casting out the love of God. If we really understood the God that we serve, if we really understood, there'd be nothing we'd be afraid of. Yeah, come on, bro. Nothing. Come on. Boldness comes when we have faith. Faith comes when we know that we are loved, when we accept that love, and we get taken care of. Mm-hmm. Boldness also comes through prayer. Yeah. It comes through prayer. Acts chapter 4, verse 29. Now consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders. Holy Servant Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the Word of God boldly. Mm. Now, most of us, if we were in a situation like that, we'd get even more freaked out. Because here we are praying, and then the whole place shakes. There's an earthquake. Because earthquakes tend to freak us out especially in California. Now, we're a bit more inland, so it's not that bad, but if you're living in L.A. or San Francisco, you know what I mean? But it actually enabled them to speak more boldly. Solicited prayer on his behalf for boldness. So not only do you pray for your own boldness, 
Pray for other people's boldness. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the gospel. As men of God grow in their faith, as we grow in our love, as we grow in ourselves but for other people, God removes the spirit of fear. Because God did not give us a spirit of fear. He did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and self-discipline. Secondly, God makes strong men. God makes strong men. But again, just like bold, men of God start out weak. Here's the reality, guys. No offense. All y'all are weak. Even Malik. I'm weak. You might right? You might even have gotten a job at the gym. You're still weak. Society will tell you that that being weak is a weakness. And it is if you stay weak. There's a difference between being weak strategically. The Bible calls that not weak, but meek, humble, gentle. A man of God is both tough and tender. There are times to be tender, there are times to be tough. But our society says, no, 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 no. Show any tenderness, show any compassion, show any emotion at all, you're weak. It's not true. It's not godly. Apostles had their moments of weakness. Matthew 26, verse 40. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. All of us as disciples start as babies in Christ. Right? Aaron is a baby in Christ. Isaiah is a baby in Christ. Don't you, we shouldn't be offended by that. Overton is a babe in Christ. All of us, like even me, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a bratty, just come babe in Christ. I'll be 25 spiritually this year. I'm still young, guys. I got married when I was 26. And that was 18 years ago. So the reality is that we can learn. But what does the Bible say about being young spiritually? It says crave pure spiritual milk so that you can be nourished, so you can grow. All disciples start out as baby Christians. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly. Here's the problem, is that we can start very strong, we can start our Christian walk strong, and then we can actually regress. We can actually get dumber. We can actually get younger. And it's not a good thing. Like, this isn't like trying to get rid of your wrinkles spiritually. No, you're actually regressing into being a little baby. So the reality, guys, is that men of God start out weak, but men of God are made strong. How do we do this? 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13. Be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. Wait, wait, that doesn't tell me how. You're right, it doesn't. It's a choice. Strength is... How many of you guys have seen videos of like flabby, fat, like, or like super skinny, weak looking people that have been able to do amazing things physically if, when the need arose? We see it all the time. Strength is a choice. 
Strength is a choice. Mental strength is a choice. Physical strength is a choice. Now, there are certain things that I can lift and I can't lift as a byproduct of the fact that I haven't been to the gym in six months. He calls the Ephesians in Ephesians 6.10, finally be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. It is a choice. How does God make us strong? He provides us a relationship with Jesus. John 15, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We need Jesus in order to be strong. The world thinks that they need a woman. The world thinks that they need to smoke weed. The world thinks that they need a job. The world thinks that they need money. The world thinks that they need pick your whatever it is to be strong. It's not the case. We need Jesus. We have Jesus. We're as strong as we need to be. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all this through Him who gives. Is the Him Jesus. We need Jesus, firstly. Second, because of Jesus and Him, His death, burial, resurrection, and then His ascension into heaven, what did He leave behind for us? The Holy Spirit. Go to Ephesians 3. How does God make men strong? By providing the aid of His Spirit inside of us. Ephesians chapter 3, look here in verse 16, it says, that out of His glorious riches, He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. What's the key themes in this passage? The power is in you. If you are in Christ, the power is in you. All you got to do is tap into it. Later on in Ephesians, you guys know this, he then provides by that spirit the armor of God. Mm -hmm. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Can I put on the armor of God without being strong in the Lord and in His mighty power? No. It starts there. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to stand. That last little stand is to remain standing. So stand your ground, do everything that you can to remain standing. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. As we grow in truth, as we grow in righteousness, in faith, and in prayer, God's Son and the Spirit will provide the aid that we need to be strong in any service that we do for God. That's how you become a man of strength. Thirdly, God makes love... God makes loving men. Now, this is kind of like, okay, I get, yeah, strong. Yeah, bold. All right. Huh, huh. You know, I also makes loving men. Yeah. But here's the problem also. Most men don't start out loving. I mean, think back to your fathers or the men in your life. Love. Is love part of their, like, 
strengths? No. Now, they all loved us in their own way. But godly love, mm, not really. The apostles were often jealous of one another. They spent a lot of time at odds with one another instead of loving one another. Wow. Verse 24 says, The ten heard about this. They were indignant with the two brothers. This is uh, James and John who talked to their mom. Once their mom talked to Jesus about, hey, can I sit on your, can one of my kids sit on your right and the other sit on your left? Right? <laughs> They're like, what? Hey, excuse me? Now, I don't know if they were just like angry at the fact that mom had asked for these things or whether they were jealous of the fact that they got, you know, James and John had the opportunity to ask, but they didn't ask themselves. We don't really know. Luke 22, verse 24, a dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be greatest. In any group of dudes, there's going to be some jealousy. There's going to be some rivalry. It just, it just is. That doesn't make it godly. That doesn't make it right. And again, it's about the, re, the realness of the Bible. James and John developed a reputation for being not only because they were prideful, but also at one point in, Mark, or in Luke 9, 54, when the disciple James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, down from heaven to destroy them because there was this city that was rejecting the message and the gospel of Jesus. Do, you did it in Sodom and Gomorrah, God. Let's do it now. Let me see it. Ah, it, it wasn't like, hey, Jesus, could you call it down? It's like, no, do you want us to do it? Wow. Think about the presumption. You, you really think you could do that? You think you got the chops, homie, to violate the city. Serious? Like, I could just, Jesus is probably just laughing. Like, you guys are dumb. But this is the reputation. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, to them he gave the name Boanerges, means sons of thunder. That's Mark chapter 3, verse 17. Jesus literally gives them this name, sons of thunder. So we know that men of God can not be very loving. And if you've been in church long enough, you know that from time to time a brother's going to say something dumb. The brother's going to act stupid sometimes and be unloving. But what do we do with that? We become the men who are loving. God develops men who love. John, one of the sons of thunder, becomes the apostle of love. If you read 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, it's very clear that he's changed his tune. Over the course of time, over the course of life, Literally, the church hit the biggest thing that he said. You got the apostle John coming. We got John coming to church today. He's going to preach for us. And you know what he does? He gets up in front of the church and goes, Love each other. Mm. And then sits back down. <laughs> this is stemming from a guy who said, Jesus, let's annihilate those fools. Wow. Wow. I never thought of that. Oh, let's, just, let's just love each other, guys. 1 John chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4, look here in verse 7. 1 John 4 verse 7, it says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love. Not that we love God, but His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. 
Just circle the love in that. Just every word, like you would not be able to see the entire passage anymore because of all the times he just says love. Peter would refer to Paul as our beloved brother in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. So how does God make loving men? Well, we just read in 1 John that first He loves us. When you're loved, you got nothing to prove. When you really feel loved, when you really feel protected, when you really feel cared for, anybody could do anything to you. Like, whatever. It's not... Somebody wants to call you names, you're like, okay. If you feel secure, if you feel loved. This is why people feel the need to, like, get into fights and stuff. You call me a name? Okay, whatever. Right? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, right? You guys have heard that before? Or... 10 to 11, this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Yeah. Mm, that's right. And we can do that because God loves us. Yeah. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9, write this one down. Now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you. For, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. Your love will be tested. God goes, no, go deeper. Go higher, go wider. More and more. So because God loved us first, we can love others. He also provided Jesus as an example of love. John 13, 34, 35. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. How? What's the new command here? The Old Testament talked about loving God and loving one another. No problem. So what's the new command? As I have loved you, as Jesus is the example of love. as we allow ourselves to be moved by God's love in us and for us, we can grow in our love for others. Finally, we see from the scripture that God makes sound men. Now, I'm not a fan of the way that the New International Version uh, translates this because sound men is different. And I'm going to dive into this a little bit. But You might read in other translations, it says, God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-control in the NIV, or of a sound mind, or of, uh, of a soundness. The Greek word is softness, or sophrinomios. Can't even pronounce it. If you want to write it down, it's S-O-P-H-R-O-N-I-S-M-O-S. Oh, wow. Come on, man. Say it. Sophronimus. There we go. Here's what it means. An admonishing or calling to soundness of mind, to moderation and self-control. In one of the commentaries that I read in, in preparation for this, it says, The Greek word denotes one of sober mind, a man of prudence and discretion. The state referred to here is that in which the mind is well balanced and under right influences, in which it sees things in their just proportions and relations, in which it is not feverish and excited, but where everything is in its proper place. That's a sound mind. That's self-control. It depicts one who is stable and self-controlled in both life and in doctrine. 
Familiar passage to us, 1 Timothy 4.16. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. This is somebody who has a sound mind. This is somebody who has self-control. This quality is to be found in mature Christians. Not that it shouldn't be found in all Christians, but it's specifically found in mature Christians. So bishops or elders and shepherds must be sober, of sober mind. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. Titus 1 verse 8, rather he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Older men are to be temperate. So not just those who lead in the church, but older men are to be temperate and self-controlled. Titus 2 verse 2, teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in the faith, in love, and in endurance. But also the young men are called to do the same. 2 Timothy 1, 2, right? We just read that. For the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. He also tells Timothy, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in faith, and in purity. How does God make sound men? Well, first of all, through the obedience of the words of Jesus. Through obeying the scriptures, he makes a sound man. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, Therefore, if anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock, the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. You look at today's society and everybody will change their opinion based on the wind. Oh, the majority, especially right now in political sphere, right? Every, everybody's kind of ramping up their political campaigns to get ready for November 2024. And so what's going on? Oh, well, so-and-so said this, and so-and-so said that. Oh, oh I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow this person. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow that person. Oh, people don't like me in the polls right now, so I'm going to change my opinion. Yeah. I just read that the state of California struck down a measure to have harsher penalties on human trafficking, uh, people that that have been caught in human trafficking. They said, no, we're not going to put these these into play. This is the state legislature. They're like, the current laws on human trafficking are fine. And they're not, actually. You go read them, they're wacky. They're like nothing. Nothing. What they, were, what they were going to put in place was turning human trafficking into an offense that would be equal to murder and rape. And they said, no, 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 no. We don't, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. Well, guess what happened? Enough people rose up and were like, no, you're going to do it. And what did they do? They changed their mind. Amen. And so they passed it. Amen? Awesome, now, it doesn't work out that way all the time. In fact, most of the time, you, somebody does something and, and you just wishy-washy, you just flip-flop back and forth. We need to make sure that our lives are on the rock. How do we make sure that our lives are on the rock? We obey the Word of God. We don't obey society. We don't obey the times. We don't obey our appetites. We obey the Word of God. We also set our minds on things of the Spirit. Not just the Word of God, we already talked about that, but producing the fruit of the Spirit. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. See, what's cool is that God gives us the choice. God gives us the choice. He loves us enough to give us the choice on whether or not we're going to choose to live His way or we're going to choose to live our own way. And the more that we choose to live our way, the easier our life might get in some senses, but the harder it's going to get in others. Romans chapter 8, verse 5 says, Those who live according to the flesh 
have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. Let me tell you something. Every single one of you is mind controlled. This is not conspiracy theory. This is not tinfoil hat drama. This is fact. Today, right now, you are either controlled by the flesh or you are controlled by the spirit. One or the other, bro. You know, people come into Christianity and they go, man, this is so controlling. Mm. No, you just thought that outside of the church was not controlling. <laughs> you are being controlled. You are being controlled by your appetites. You are being controlled by the flesh. You're being controlled by your, your girlfriend, or you're being controlled by the boyfriend. You're being controlled by all these other things. Which would you rather be controlled by? The Word of God? The Spirit of God? Or Satan? Oh, really? Come on, Eric. You're kind of sensational. Like, Satan, really? Yeah. If you're not following Jesus, who else are you following? That's it, yeah. bro. Yeah. That's what the Bible says. Yeah. There's only two ways. The, 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 yeah. Like, society understands there's good and there's evil. There's not, like, kind of good and kind of evil. Right. It either is good or it is evil. You are living a good life. You are living an evil life. Yeah. There's only, and there's only one way to live a good life. According to the scriptures. Yeah. Come on, bro. Mm. A mind governed by the flesh mm. versus governed by the spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. So I say, walk by the spirit, and you'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. You ever wonder why like doing the right thing is so hard sometimes? Because there's this dramatic pull to try to get you to do the wrong thing. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual morality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. There's that sound mind again. Against such things, there is no law. What kind of men God makes? For those willing to submit to the workmanship of God, He's trying to create fearless men. He's trying to create strong men. He's trying to create loving men. He's trying to create sound men, men of self-control. We may not start out our lives this way. In fact, you might look at the how many, how many, many years you have lived so far and gone, man, that, that has not been my story. And most of us, it hasn't been our story. We've lived the majority of our lives the opposite of these things. We've lived in cowardice. We've lived in weakness. We've lived in hatred. We've lived in instability. But with Christ, when we become a disciple, when we take on the mantle of God to be men of God, it says again, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, For the Spirit of God gave, God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. God is willing to give us courage. Notice he says God gave this to us. If you're in Christ tonight, God gave this to you. Yeah. This is already in you. God is willing to give us courage, to give us strength, to give us love, and to give us stability. Yeah. The question is, are we willing to submit to His workmanship in our lives? 
this is what will change this society forever. This is what will change this city. This is what will change your family. Those of you that are looking forward to a family someday, this will change it. If you let God make you. So let me ask you, what kind of man is God making you into tonight? What kind of man is God making you into tonight? My prayer is that it is indeed a fearless man, a strong man, a loving man, and a sound man. I love you guys very much. Come on.